to really understand the direction that China is taking this year and how its leaders plan to meet the serious economic and geopolitical challenges ahead, an important start is to look at something they call Liang Hui. The term refers to the two annual plenary sessions of the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which recently concluded in Beijing. From the cementing of an unprecedented third term for President Xi Jinping and the unveiling of his new leadership team, to the sweeping reform of key central government institutions, there is a wealth of information to be gleaned here. To help us unpack it all is The Post's executive editor, Chao Chung Yan, a veteran journalist and China specialist. So you are dealing with something that maybe you don't like, but it is also not what you imagine to be. It's much more complicated. The dynamic behind it is much more nuanced. Now, without understanding this, the risk is that you will be inventing an enemy that is only existing in your head. That, to me, is the risk the Western world is facing today. He applies decades of experience in covering China as a frontline reporter and top editor to dismantle the misconceptions and explain the facts with an intimate and astute understanding of the country. In this episode of Talking Post, we listen to Chao Chung Yan on what to expect from China in the year ahead. Hi, Chung Yan. Good to have you on the show. Chung Yan's in uh, Beijing. He's uh, our executive editor, but he's also uh, the guy who drives our newspaper's China coverage. And he's there in Beijing right now because he has just finished uh, directing operations for our coverage of the end of the two sessions of uh, China's top political advisory body and uh, China's top legislature. So let's start first with uh, uh, Xi Jinping. So if you look at the general discourse now, the main takeaway uh, based on what uh, the rest of the media is reporting, the Western mainstream media in particular, is uh, Xi Jinping is, uh, has uh, secured an unprecedented uh, third term as president. And uh, most people see this as a uh, dictator for life. Is it as simple as that? Yeah, I wish things can be that simple. And uh, the fact is, it, it, it's uh, um, actually, this is a very crude and a, a very simplistic view. And then uh, to focus the analysis of China just on that, I think it's a risk of missing the much bigger picture. And it is, it's also, to be frank, it's also risking of misunderstanding what we are dealing with. So to begin with, I, I, I think we have to understand uh, that uh, in China, it's true that this is a one-party dictatorship. So they say that up front, they're not hiding anything. They, they say, uh, say it loud and they, they want everyone to understand. They have no intention to change that. It's going to be one party. Now, as for within the party, who is going to be head of the party? A lot of people say that uh, when Xi Jinping changed uh, the constitution, that will, uh, that allows him to be remain in power for life. That's factually incorrect because uh, there's no term limit for the party chief. If uh, staying in power for life is his only purpose, it will be much simpler. He can simply install someone else as the president because that's just an honorary title. It actually holds no real power. So the fact that uh, he took all this trouble to actually uh, um, change the constitution and then remove the term limit for the president shows that uh, the purpose is not just to remain in power, but he wants to do it in his particular way, which is to fuse the state and the power and the party into one. So that's the real purpose. And then we have to remember w w what's the background, uh, how uh, Xi Jinping come to where uh, uh, he is now. So as you mentioned, Yondan, uh, I think uh, uh, 10 years ago when he first came to power, all the uh, China experts at the time, most of them, vast majority of them, dismissed this as a transitional figure. They, they say that because he has no clear um, <coughs> clique background, he has uh, no clear power base. He is a compromised candidate between Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Eventually, 
one of the camp will uh, win, and then he would be set aside. And and then at the time, a lot of people say that this guy will not even last for one term. Ten years later, now people start to say he is going to be China's emperor for life. So that kind of um, uh, uh, gap of understanding, actually, to me, it shows that how people misunderstand China and misunderstand the Chinese Communist Party. So let's uh, go back a bit. That uh, uh, ten years ago, if you look at the ten years ago, the, um, China, even though looking from the outside, is a uh, up and rising uh, superpower, but uh, it's uh, internally. Uh, the uh, political elite in Beijing, at the time, they felt a strong sense of crisis, because the country was rived with uh, corruption, and uh, the party was getting increasingly disconnected with the grassroots. The wealth gap is getting bigger and bigger, and then the internally, most important, internally, the ruling Communist Party becomes so fragmented that there's a even difficult for the party elite to sit down and uh, have a consensus over anything. It become a very fragmented uh, party. At the time, the, uh, the the party heavyweight, Wang Qishan, was openly talking about the French Revolution. He was drawing the comparison between the French Revolution and the China at the time. And if you read, if you don't trust the Chinese, you, if you uh, uh, go to Google and you, you search for the WikiLeak, you can read uh, all those uh, uh, diplomatic cable uh, uh, sent by Hillary Clinton, and uh, uh, you can read the uh, uh, reports by Robert Gates. These people at the time, their main concern is that uh, it's not that China is going to replace US as the number one. Their concern is that uh, China may collapse and what we can do when China collapse. The Robert Gates was uh, openly telling people that he was uh, deeply concerned the Chinese military may get out of control and the party can no longer hold, uh, uh, have a meaningful control over the military. That was the biggest control, uh, concern for the US elite at the time. So this is the background where that uh, the, we're seeing the Chinese Communist Party particularly among the elite. This huge sense of crisis means that they come to understand that uh, they need to do something drastic. They need to re, uh, uh, concentrate the power to the center. Instead of uh, doing the, the so-called uh, uh, decentralized uh, uh, movement, they want to re-centralize, uh, regain the power uh, back to a strong core because they believe only with a strong core, they can actually carry a lot of uh, uh, necessary reform to revitalize the party, and then to ensure that the China will have a stable environment for it to continue uh, its uh, modernization. So that's the bigger background of all this. So at these two sessions, that's the last fin finishing touch for Xi Jinping to finish the Reconcentration of power at the top, and then he he now built a team of his uh, own people. He then also this time uh, announced a very sweeping restructuring plan. The restructuring plan is actually to make sure that uh, the party will have greater and more direct control in the all these so-called key areas. And uh, the justification he gave to the Chinese people is that uh, China right now is uh, facing a very unique historical moment when the China has never been so close to the uh, total uh, national uh, rejuvenation. Now, you, you can have a lot of skepticism about what he says, etc. But the fact is, if you check all these uh, American universities from time to die, time, they will do the opinion uh, uh, survey of the Chinese people. Then you have to say, he has the support of the majority of the Chinese public. That's the issue. So to me, the risk of uh, depicting everything happening in China as simply as uh, Xi Jinping become the dictator in life, of life, the risk is this. You are basically 
turning China into a plus-size North Korea. But you only need to come to China and spend a week or maybe a month living in China, traveling across the country. You will understand that this is not a North Korea plus size. So you are dealing with something that maybe you don't like, but it is also not what you imagine to be. It's much more complicated. The dynamic behind it is much more nuanced. Now, without understanding this, I think that the, 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 the risk is that you will be inventing an enemy that is only existing in your head. That, to me, is the risk the Western world is facing today. China also unveiled uh, its new leadership lineup. And uh, a couple of uh, interesting uh, appointments there. Uh, key, of course, is the new premier, uh, Li Qiang. Now, uh, that role is generally seen as having been diminished under the, uh, uh, with the previous uh, premier, Li Keqiang. And uh, all to do, again, with the <coughs> consolidation of power by uh, Xi Jinping. But this new guy, who is he exactly? And what can you expect from him? Li Qian, uh, uh, he was party secretary of Shanghai. And before that, he also managed uh, uh, Zhejiang province, which is uh, China's uh, economic engine. And uh, he has a, a very rich local governance experience. He's someone who basically rides through the ranks. And then uh, he has good relationship with uh, President Xi Jinping. So that's a um, good chemistry between the two. So a lot of people tend to uh, uh, dismiss Li Qian as just, uh, say, a loyalist of uh, Xi Jinping. I mean, the, the, the thing is, in today's China, anyone who can get to the top position, their po political loyalty is a given. So you can say uh, uh, this, is, this kind of analysis, in a sense, become pathology. Because anyone who uh, rises to the top, they are, of course, at least politically, uh, uh, have a good relationship with uh, the top leader. Oh, let me let, uh, me let me interject here. I mean, uh, just just to yeah. uh, support your point there, this this constant uh, uh, takeaway you have uh, when China rolls out its uh, leadership is uh, Xi Jinping, uh, whoever the president is, has packed his cabinet with loyalists. I mean. That's what everyone does, right? Duh. I yes. mean, any government, yes. any Western government, any democracy, any dictatorship anywhere, when the head of the country puts his team together, who else is he going to give, get except loyalists? People have to be loyal and follow his vision. Exactly. I mean, if you look at uh, 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 any government, if the president cannot pick the man he has the full trust in, then uh, we only see this when we have the kind of um, uh, crisis government where you don't have a clean uh, window from the election. Then you have to cobble together a coalition. Then you will have people who are actually not your choice, but put in a key position. The, the, this is a, the kind of uh, simplistic analysis I want to avoid is that uh, the only thing you can say is that uh, he is a loyalist of uh, Xi Jinping. Th that basically, to me, is not really telling your reader or uh, uh, your audience anything that is uh, useful, right? And for that, I, I think Li Chan has uh, caused for us at least to be cautiously optimistic. We have to give the guy time to prove himself. And then his track record means that he has already proven himself in order to get to where he is. So he, by all the uh, accounts that we uh, we talk to different people, including uh, uh, officials, including uh, business people who had uh, uh, work experience with him, we talk to people who uh, know him decades ago. So gathered from all these people, the impression is that this guy, first of all, is a uh, very pragmatic. And then uh, he is someone who actually very much uh, care about the uh, economic growth, understand the concern of the private sector, understand the concern of the foreign business. From the, uh, the two session uh, premier press conference, you can see that uh, the approach is uh, very pragmatic. He's saying that uh, he's, uh, first of all, he's uh, saying that uh, 
everyone thinks the economic growth market of 5% is uh, very moderate. But he is saying that even to achieve that is not going to be that easy because we have to understand right now the external environment is highly uh, volatile. If you look at uh, all this uh, banking crisis, the food crisis, the energy crisis, uh, and uh, the weakening uh, demand from major economies. And uh, for China, uh, is, uh, China just uh, uh, emerged from the uh, COVID control. Uh, right now, the country is gradually reopening itself, but uh, the top leader also worry about what happened if there's a second wave. So all these uncertainties, you need to factor in when you set the target. From what I witnessed so far, I don't think we can just dismiss this as a yes man to Xi Jinping. Granted, his relationship with Xi, the dynamic between the two will be very different from uh, the previous ones. But this can be a plus. That means that he will have the political backing of the president. They will have a greater understanding of each other. They don't have to second guess each other. Then he probably will have more leeway to implement some of the policies. So Chung-Yen, talking about uh, Li Chang's, uh, the task ahead, the challenges ahead, the economy is a big deal after the carnage that uh, COVID has wrought. Based on the discussions in the two sessions, uh, the indications that he's given when he's talked to the media, etc., what's the outlook looking like? What are you expecting in terms of China's economy? I think uh, the economy before the two sessions, many people think that uh, uh, China will announce a very, uh, an, a very aggressive target because uh, people think that uh, this is the first year of uh, uh, Xi Jinping's third term. Uh, he would want to begin it with a ban. He would want to uh, get a very uh, so-called bright uh, uh, GDP growth figure so that uh, uh, it's a show of strings, right? So, so uh, politically speaking, it will be desirable for China to announce a, a more aggressive target. And then secondly, the people also think that China can actually achieve a higher target because uh, Last year, the uh, uh, the growth rate uh, was only 3%. So you start from a relatively lower base. And then the COVID control uh, has been reversed. The economy actually shows signs of recovery. And then there's a, a, all this reason to be more optimistic. So if you look at uh, before the two session, uh, most uh, invest, investment house, the prediction is that the Chinese economy can grow 5.3%, some say 5.5%. Some economists even say that uh, 6% is achievable. But in the end, the Beijing set the target to 5%. This to many people is uh, actually a quite conservative target. The reason behind uh, this is actually in the mind of uh, 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 Xi Jinping and other top leaders, achieving economic growth is not an end in itself, it's not everything. They are thinking much ahead. They are, they are planning uh, the long term. Now, they understand that uh, uh, China's problem is not only to achieve certain percentage of growth, but uh, first of all, the world we are facing is getting increasingly complicated and chaotic. So from the two session, if you listen very carefully, the, uh, no matter in the work report, in uh, Xi Jinping's speech, in the uh, uh, Li Qian's uh, premier press conference, the emphasis is uh, very much focused on removing the risks, uh, deleveraging the risks, and uh, uh, also changing the, 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 the role of the government. Um, the, this part is important, particularly when it comes to uh, developing China's own science and technology, because uh, the other challenge China is facing is that uh, in that assessment, the U.S. Uh, containment of China uh, on the technology and the science front is going to be long term. This is not something that uh, is going to, uh, to be changed uh, anytime soon. So they need to leave enough room to restructure the economy, restructure the government, and to change the, uh, the, the, 
the, the, the government's role so that the government will switch from the administrator to become the facilitator to support the uh, uh, business and uh, also the scientists and the researchers to lead the innovation. Chung and also uh, another significant uh, appointment in this new leadership lineup is uh, the foreign minister because of the international, the work that needs to be done on the international stage. And this man is Chin Gang. Now, uh, he's somebody who's uh, been criticized in the past as a wolf warrior. What are you expecting from him on the international stage? We actually talked to uh, quite a few foreign diplomats about that impression of Chin Gang. So description one diplomat used. He said uh, that Qing Gai is someone who, uh, in comparison with uh, uh, his uh, predecessor Wang Yi, is someone that is uh, straight tough. So this is a guy who, when it is uh, uh, necessary, he can be very charming. He can get into a room and do the small talk and get him, uh, endear himself to you, and then uh, uh, chit chat with you like a, a friend. He can be uh, gracious. He can uh, 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 put you at ease. He actually has done that uh, while, uh, when he was the uh, China's ambassador to the US. He made a lot of uh, trips to the, uh, um, the so-called flyover states in the United States, talk to the people on the ground and uh, try to endear himself to them. So he can do that. He's not always uh, a, a wolf warrior who come out and uh, uh, fight people and uh, pick a fight. But uh, they also uh, describe him as a uh, straight tough, means that uh, he is actually not going to be shy if you step on China's national interests. I remember one diplomat told me that uh, he can come to you, he can express the anger or the displease from China and make you understand why doing so is not going to be okay with uh, Beijing. He's not going to be shy in convening that message. To a lot of the uh, people, they actually think this is a, a good thing. Because uh, right now, China is uh, facing an environment uh, where you, there's a, 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 it, the, the, the whole narrative is uh, very much dominated by uh, the West, particularly by the US. Now, for China to really make itself heard, for China to really to convey its message to others, then you have to say this, uh, the message with uh, confidence. And then you have to do it in a very straightforward way that others can actually understand. And then the uh, second part is, uh, he is someone who have the political backing from the top. So that is why he can deal with a lot of a complicated situation. Uh, with confidence. And uh, for a diplomat, I think that is uh, going to be important. Now, he is going to uh, be uh, part of a two-man team because uh, Wang Yi is now become the Politburo member and uh, will uh, perform as special envoy of uh, Xi Jinping. So Wang Yi and the Qing Gang will form a core to drive China's foreign policy. And I think this is going to be a good team. It's the yin and yang. So uh, Wang Yi is this someone who is uh, very elegant, very uh, gracious, can really charm people, and uh, almost like a, a, a scholar. And then you have Qing Gan, who has uh, bring this kind of uh, straight toughness to the partnership. So it's going to be a good mixture of the uh, uh, of two personality. And then maybe this will become the new phase for China's foreign policy. Let's talk about Taiwan. We're living in dangerous times, and you can see uh, how Taiwan is always the potential uh, flashpoint. But from uh, my reading of the two sessions and how this particular issue was discussed, the language from Beijing is still very uh, nuanced. It's, it's quite restrained, uh, rather than uh, aggressive or you know, fire and brimstone. Despite uh, all the trends about the U.S. Uh, sending politicians across there, you know, basically hordes of people going down there and encouraging Taiwan to stand up to China, this uh, arming of uh, arming Taiwan to the teeth 
that also goes on. But from the takeaway from the, the two sessions, uh, did you find that uh, what the world was expecting, you know, China to get even more aggressive, didn't really materialize? Yeah, not only is, uh, uh, you say that uh, the messaging is uh, still very uh, restrained. I would say that it's uh, become even more restrained because uh, uh, if you, not only the two session, if you, uh, no matter it's the work report or the the chance uh, 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 premier press conference, and if you go back to the 20th party congress last year, if you read the part about uh, Taiwan, right? The language is, uh, uh, actually, uh, I would describe it as uh, firm, but uh, uh, restrained. So China, on one hand, needs to tell the world why Taiwan is a political red line for China. Because you have to accept the fact Taiwan is not another Ukraine, because uh, everyone, most countries in the world, including the United States and uh, uh, its allies, they actually never acknowledge Taiwan as a separate sovereign state. Taiwan is not Ukraine. Ukraine is a United Nations recognized sovereign state. Taiwan is not. Everyone uh, 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 officially say that they acknowledge that uh, Taiwan is a part of China, or they acknowledge that uh, uh, Beijing is having a claim over Taiwan. They don't dispute that, right? So. If that's the operating uh, uh, basis uh, for the bilateral relations, then China have to remind everyone. Taiwan, to me, is the political red line. It's the core to my national interests, and you have to respect that. But after they, 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 they said that, they talk about uh, they will prioritize to uh, use the peaceful means to resolve the Taiwan problem. They talk about uh, the need for the uh, people across the Taiwan Strait to uh, strengthen their communication, strengthen their dialogue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are very much aware that uh, ever since last year, there's at least a narrative comparing Taiwan to Ukraine, and basically trying to say that uh, Taiwan is going to be the next Ukraine. And uh, to Beijing, this is not accidental. They think this is an organized approach, basically to use the Ukraine tragedy and the trying to draw a comparison with Taiwan in order to portray China as the unstable force, to portray China as an aggressor, and to portray that uh, 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 China as the troublemaker in the region. Now, from almost every week, you have a U.S government agency or a military put out a report say that China is going to invade China, uh, Taiwan in uh, this and that year. To the Chinese, they understand that everyone in the world is watching over Taiwan with concern. And then if they don't have a counter to this narrative, then China will become someone who are uh, basically upsetting the uh, status quo and the uh, the world peace. So they need to counter this narrative. That is why in the message, they need to be firm. So leave no room for anyone who try to use this as a China taking a step back and then trying to use this to push for Taiwan's de facto independence. They need to be firm over that. But at the same time, they also need to send a message to the world is that we are not really trying to use the military option to resolve this. If in the end there was a military conflict, the blame is not, not on our side. We are tr only trying to be reactive. We are only trying to defend our interests. So that's the message. Shogun, uh, I would love to continue this conversation for a couple more hours, but uh, all good things must come to an end. Let me just say uh, in conclusion that uh, we live in these very dangerous times and uh, uh, especially regarding China and the way uh, China is perceived and presented by, uh, in the, to the rest of the world. I find the biggest problem is not necessarily Western governments and their agenda against China, but uh, mainstream media in particular 
propagating that narrative like stenographers rather than uh, uh, critical thinkers when it comes to China. You know, this whole trope about bad China, good America. So in that uh, atmosphere, I think it's very important that uh, people who understand China, who understand Chinese psychology, who live in China, who deal with China, who eat, drink, and sleep China every day, Voices like yours, long may they resonate and long may they prevail. Thanks very much, Chungyan, for joining us. I'll see Thanks. you when you get back. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.